All right. Okay, let's get back to pumping lemma stuff, unless there are questions before then. Everyone's dazed and confused already. <laughs> but, uh, but really, any questions? Oh, sorry? What do you mean P even or odd? Oh, yeah, I, I have no idea whether it's uh, even or odd or anything. At least value, I have no idea. Yeah. So I have a question about what we were just talking about before mm -hmm. break. Yeah. You said that VXY could, could appear anywhere within the string? Yes, because it's not a prefix or a suffix of the string, because we have this, the U and Z parts at the front and end. So it couldn't appear at the very beginning of the string? It, it could. It, um, that U is a one. Technically, you're right, but we're just going to allow the case that U is empty anyway. And Z is empty? Uh, possibly, yeah. You're, you're technically right, but uh, it's easier to argue when, it's, when you allow that possibility. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Uh, the, we have to look, only look at the strings of length at least p. Yes. The language can contain strings. Oh, good question. Um, is that on the quiz tonight? The one where if there's no string of length at least p, could you guarantee something about the language, or was that on an earlier quiz? I forget. Oh, okay. So um, the, this isn't uh, specific to this, but Suppose you want to apply either pumping lemma, and you find that there's no string at all of length at least p in the language. What can you guarantee about the language? So that means every string is of length at most p minus 1, because there's no string in the language of length at least p. So what can you guarantee about the language? Oh, it must be finite, because all strings are of length at most this constant minus 1. But if you find a string that is in the language of length at least p, what could you guarantee? Well, if you found one, then look at this. If I increase i by 1, do I get a new string every single time? Yeah, how can you tell? The, the, well, the length gets longer, right? Because v, y, I, pop, I put in another copy of v and y. That means I add some character, which means the string gets longer. Oh, so there, if there is a string in the language of length at least p, the language must be infinite. So that's actually a way to check if a language is finite or infinite. Cool. Any other? So I like that kind of question. But any other questions? Yeah. The p not being in front. I'm not sure what you're saying. Oh, yeah. So note that the, the string here has a u and a z at the beginning. And the, th and the thing that we're focusing on is the vxy in the middle. We're not guaranteeing anything about the u and the z part. So this vxy can be anywhere in the string. Whereas with the regular case, we guarantee that xy is at most p, but that's the prefix of the string. So it can only be at the beginning. But here it can appear anywhere. And so it makes this more difficult in some sense. But uh, hopefully it won't be too difficult. Any other questions? OK, let's actually prove the language is not context-free. So this is our going to be our prototypical one, just like 0 to the n, 1 to the n was for regular. I want to show that this is not a CFL. How should I start? Assume that it is. OK. Uh, L is a CFL. One line down. What do we do next? Then there exists a uh, this constant P for L. Yes. So then exists a constant P for L. OK. Now what do we do? Hmm. 
What do we what do we do next? Ooh, we got to pick some string with what properties? Is that you know, most this p characters and is in the language? Any suggestion? Oh, how about just replace the n with p? So let's choose uh, zero to the p, one to the p, two to the p. So this has length at least p and is in the language, so we're all set. It may not work for this string, but if I can find some string that works, we're all set. It will work for this string, though. Well, let's see. Remember, the vxy part can appear anywhere in the string, right? It doesn't have to be at the beginning. Well, I'm going to sh show you a bad way to approach it, even though it's correct. But, and then I'll show you a better way to approach it. Well, the VXY part, could it be only in the zeros? Certainly. Could it be all, only in the ones? Yeah, could it only be in the twos? Could it cross between the zeros and the ones? Yeah, it, it's called straddling the boundary is, is the term for it. What about the ones and the twos? Could it go from the zeros all the way to the twos? No, why not? It must have, at, that would mean it has length at least p plus 2, but it has length at most p. So therefore, it can't hit the zeros, ones, and twos simultaneously. Well, for each of those cases, we could say that u is equal to this, v is equal to this, x is this, y is this, z is this, and then pick a value of i, and then we get out of the language. I could do that for each of those five cases. Right? That, that sounds like a hassle, doesn't it? It will work, and it is correct, but I want to suggest a better way. Well, let's see. Let's, whatever the decomposition is, so pick any decomposition uh, into the five parts. Uh, oops. Uh, according to rules. So pick any, your favorite one, as long as it uh, abides by the first two rules. And then we'll try to see, uh, could we pick a value of i that works? Well, let's see. Let's pick i equals 2. Actually, any value, of, of course, other than 1 will work. But let's pick i equals 2 as an example. Well, could the number of zeros change? In, in whatever this is. Yeah, certainly. Uh, what about the number of ones? Yeah, it, it could change. Number twos could also change, right? Could they all change the same number? No, why not? Right. Uh, let's see. A, a way that we can phrase it is the number of zeros in W, if this is, at, if, if this is strictly larger than zero, meaning it has a zero, this implies that the number of twos in W is zero, right? Because it can't have zeros and simultaneously have twos in it, in the original string W. Well, if we do this, um, so if we pick i equals two, so look at uh, when we put the two on, then what had to happen? The number of zeros had to go up, but the number of two stayed the same. So that means that the uh, number of zeros increased, uh, and number of uh, twos stayed the same. Oh, sorry? It, it actually won't matter. But I, I'm looking at this because um, technically I could look at VXY, but uh, it won't matter in this. Oh, oh, you're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah, thank you for fixing that. Yeah, it needs to be VXY. You're right. Because, uh, because W is the entire string at the beginning. So the number of zeros is p, which is not what we want. 
so, so it, it told us nothing. So the VXY is what we want here. But the, another case, does this handle every decomposition? No, because it may be that the VXY has some twos in it, right? That's certainly possible. Then if we have the number of twos being strictly positive, then the number of zeros in VXY is zero for the analogous reason. And then from this, I equals two gives similar conclusion. Because if, we, if I put another copy of v, x, y, of v and Y in, then I'm putting more twos in, then, I, and I didn't touch the number of zeros. So therefore the number of twos went up, but the number of zeros stayed the same. And so that contradicts um, uh, th the string being in this language because it has to have the same number of zeros and twos. But does this still handle all cases? What if VXY is entirely contained in the ones? That's certainly possible. Did that, did that handle in the other two cases? Uh, we need to handle that case as well. So let's actually label these. Case one, case two, and then this will be the last one, case three. The number of ones is, uh, there's at least one of one in there. In fact, we can say more than that, but let's just worry about this. Then if I pump up to I equals two, what happens? That means I put more ones in the string, and I didn't put zeros or twos into the string. So did I just leave the language? Yeah, by definition. So I equals two guarantees number of ones increased, but number of zeros didn't. Uh, actually, I can't say that. Because I don't know whether it has zeros or twos or not. Um, technically, I can say that it has neither. But um, either number of zeros uh, uh, stayed the same or number of twos stayed the same. But not both. Uh, it, it could be both. Yeah, it actually is in this case because um, the first two cases handle if you have any zero at all, and the second case handles if you have any two at all, which means that the third case, if you land there, has all of VXY contained in the ones part, meaning it has zero of either. But I'm just um, saying that um, you could combine all of these into one, but it's just saying that if you happen to have any zeros or twos at all, then you must have one of the two stay the same, no matter what happens. Well, if you, you can combine them in the following way. If you look at any arbitrary decomposition, then um, if you just increase uh, i to 2, if you set i equal to 2, then you added more characters in the string, which means that the number of zeros, ones, and twos could not have increased the same amount because uh, the number of characters in all three parts must be different, right? Because you must have some character, because VY is not empty, and you can't touch all three parts because that means you have to have the length at least P plus two, okay? Um, of course, we can make this way more formal and say that like uh, U is this, V is this, but I think this is a lot easier to uh, see and understand than that. So the first case, just to recap, is if you have any zeros at all, then the number of twos must be zero. You, you can't have any twos, which means if you pump up, you added more zeros, but you kept the number of twos the same. Yeah? I actually don't, uh, I don't need to worry about the ones for that case. As long as the, I guarantee that the number of twos stayed the same, that's all I need. <coughs> Other questions? Yeah. Is it just sort of implied in this that 
it's the twos can't increase because there's three variables that we need to increase. Yeah, that, that's, the, sort of the, that's the intuitive argument, is to say that uh, you can't have the same number of characters in all three parts which because you have to span across this uh, across substring of length p okay, yeah. and some more, which can't be possible. And so therefore, you can't increase the number of zeros, ones, and twos the same, uh, in, in the same amount. You, you can increase two of them the same, right? But you can't increase all three the same. Other questions? Yeah. What do you mean show with the numbers instead of letters? It, yeah, I could, but it's just like I need to handle five cases times five variables, which is 25 constants, which sounds like an absolute pain. But I could do it if you want. A any other questions? Yeah. I don't really want to, but okay. Well, if the if bxy is contained in the zeros only, uh -huh. then if I pump up, let's say vy's length is beta. Okay, well, whatever it is, it's some number at least one. Then the number of zeros you'll have at the end is p plus beta, but the number of ones and twos stay the same. So if you have uh, u is u to the alpha, v is zero to the, I shouldn't, actually I'll use it, beta, x is zero to the gamma, y is zero to the delta, and z is, uh, oops, Zero to the p minus alpha minus beta minus gamma minus. See why I didn't want to do this. Delta, one to the p, two to the p because I z, z is the rest of the string. This is just one case, by the way. I just wanted to see that. That's really awesome. Then if I look at uh, u v squared x y squared z, then I'm going to put another copy of beta zeros and delta zeros, right? So that means I'll have p plus um, beta plus delta, and then I'll have one to p, two to p. But then we know that vy's length is not zero, which means that since beta plus delta is at least one, then could this resulting string be in the language? No, because this, this tells me right away that I have at least one more zero. And so therefore, it can't be in the language. Yeah. And I could do this for the other four cases, if you, if you like. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. There's actually more cases than that, but yeah. Be because uh, uh, this says that V's Y's length is at least one. And v's length is beta, y's length is delta. And so beta plus delta is at least one. Yep. But I pl please don't do it this way. It's way harder to do it. The English explanation is much better, and it saves a lot of time, handles many cases at the same time. It's way easier. Please do it this way for your sanity and for my sanity. Yeah, yeah, just do it in the English way. It's way easier. If you need to do some technical reasoning, then you can, but I highly doubt you'll ever have a situation like that. Other questions? Yeah. So case one is when the x, y is all zeros? No, it, it says that it contains zeros. Okay. It, it, it may have some ones as well, but that means uh, by definition it can't have any twos, which is all we need to guarantee that. Yeah, so, so the, the only reason we care about this is that it contains some zero and it has no twos. In the other case it has a two and it, therefore it has no zero. In the other case it has only ones which means that the number of twos and the number of zeros can't increase. But the number of ones went up. So that's all that's the short argument for it. Other questions? Yeah. 
Uh, I didn't have to pick i equals 2. I could have picked i equals 0, 3, 4. Uh, every other number will work. It's just that I'm putting an additional copy of v and y into the string. And, and I'm looking at the resulting string. Could it still be in the language? But in, in all cases, and these are the only three cases, every time we left the language. And so therefore, what can we guarantee uh, about this since all three cases gave us a string that wasn't in L? It can't be context-free. So L is not a CFL. Um, so, um, before I do, a uh, good question. Um, here we need to look at any decomposition, right, and show that none of them uh, will work. I mean, in the sense that any decomposition will let me pump out. So, if I want to show that, like, the pumping lemma won't work for a actual context-free language, then I need to show you one decomposition which always works, right? Because if I want to contradict that, I need to show everyone doesn't work. But if I want to show it does work, I need to show you one. Okay. So let's go back to our prototypical language, zero to the n, one to the n. So this is context-free because we can make a grammar for it. But suppose we just try to go through the similar analysis, and we picked w is zero to the p, one to the p. Can you give me a decomposition uh, into those five parts? where I'm always going to stay in the language, no matter what value of i is. Well, well i got to guarantee vxy is at most p characters. Here's one. Uh, let u be the first p minus 1 characters, v be a single 0, x is empty, y is a single 1, z is the all the other ones. Then if I put an additional copy of V and Y in, at the same time, I'm going to add a 0 and I'm going to add a 1 on either side. But that must mean I'm going to have a string, some number of zeros followed by the same number of 1s. So I just found a decomposition which always works. No, no value of I will not work here. It will always stay in the language. Okay. Other questions? I want to look at the complement of the language we just proved is not context-free. So, um, so the language I want to consider now, L prime, is 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 2 to the n, but the complement of this. What if, which is what we're going to do, what if I showed that this, this is context-free? What would that imply about context-free languages? Are they close under complement? They are not closed. Why? If I showed this is context-free, what's the complement of this? Oh, L. Well, we just proved it wasn't context-free. So in fact, if this is context-free, then there are languages whose complements are not context-free. So in fact, uh, we'll show that they're not closed under complement. Well, what do the strings in this language look like? It, it seems like uh, many possible strings could be in here. Well, what about all the strings that have a one zero in them, a one zero substring? Are they in the complement? Yeah, well, how can I write this all the strings that have a one zero substring? So, What's a, a very fast way I can write all the strings that have a 1, 0 substring? Well, anything followed by 1, 0, followed by anything. Oh, what is that? Uh, sigma star. Sigma star. Oh, what are, what are we making here? A regex. Okay, well, that's kind of cool. So sigma star, anything followed by 1, 0, followed by anything. What about a 2, 1 substring? Is that in the complement too? Yeah, same, same idea. So 
sigma star, 2, 1, sigma star. Is there another case where the substring helps us here? Yeah, it's um, 2, 0 substring. 2, 0. It's going to be the union of all these cases plus other ones. Well, the key from all this is that all three of these are, in fact, regular because the regexes. So therefore, they're regular. What are the other cases? What's that? The what? Yeah, the different number of zeros, different number of one than twos. So that the other cases, um, the language zero to the n, one to the m, two to the p, not the same p here, where either n is not the same as m, or m is not equal to p, or um, n is not equal to p. Or all three, or all two, or two of them, or any any one of those three is the case. What does the or tell us? Union. Oh, so if I handle one of these, are the other three, other two, pretty similar? Yeah. So let's try to handle the first one, where the um, uh, shouldn't put either here. So a different number of zeros and ones, okay? Could we make a grammar for this? Well, let's see. Does the number of twos matter here? No. So let's see. Couldn't we just say that this is equal to the same thing as this, but concatenated with two star? Because I can have any number of twos appear after. Oh, pretty cool. So how do we make a grammar for a different number of zeros and ones? There's actually a convoluted way, which we'll get to eventually. But um, how can I make a grammar for this? Well, there's at least one more zero or at least one more one, right? Well, how do I make the grammar for when they're equal? Is zero, is zero s one or empty? So zero s one. Let's just start there. But I don't know which of the two cases it is. It either includes another zero at the beginning or it includes a one at the end. So actually, we can make this a little bit easier. So if we match zeros and ones up to this point, and then let's say there are more zeros then what should I be generating for the rest of it if I finish generating the zeros and ones? Just zeros. What's an easy way to just spit off zeros? Oh, there's a regular grammar for that, right? Let's make a new variable. And then zero t, it just makes zeros, only zeros. But what, how should I connect s and t up together? Uh, S goes to T. Oh, I just made a grammar for almost this, but what about the two star at the end? Well, what we can do is, let's make a new start. My pen's failing on me. S zero, and it's going to spit off S's at the, uh, sorry, spit off twos at the beginning. So, so it's first going to pick something in the first part, which is different numbers, zeros and ones. And I'm going to have another variable over here called B, which just spits off twos at the end. By no means is, is this the smallest grammar for this. It, it actually isn't. But the B is just going to spit off twos at the end. It, the two doesn't have to be after the B. but. It, all it does is just it spits twos off. Wait, didn't we just make a grammar for this? Cool. What about the other two cases where n is 
uh, number zeros not equal to number twos. Could we handle that very similarly? Yeah, we just do the exact same idea, but we just spit off ones in the middle. What about the n different numbers ones and twos? Well, I just spit off zeros at the beginning and use a similar grammar for ones and twos. What's there? Yeah. Well, what can I tell about this? What can I tell about this language right here? Context-free, why? There's, I just made a grammar for it. So this is a CFL, a, a language, context-free language. Wait, isn't it just the union of regular languages and context-free languages? Are context-free languages closed under union? Yeah. Are regular languages context-free? Yeah. Oh, what did we just show about this resulting language? It's context-free. So, in fact, this is a CFL, believe it or not. All because we're just analyzing what the types of strings look like. So, what did we just show about context-free languages in general? They're not closed in a complement. So real world application, if you want to, um, uh, if you are kind of malicious in some sense and you want to generate the set, the set of all C++ programs that are not compilable, that's not necessarily possible with the grammar in general case. Because if they were closed under complement, then there is a grammar for it. But there may or may not be one. Of course, there could be one, but there might not be. So the, take this to note. Just because it says not closed in a complement, that does not mean that the complement of a context-free language is not context-free. Both of them could be context-free. But it's just that it's not always true that it's context-free. OK, any questions on that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, good question. I should add, uh, yeah, thank you for that. So T, or let's add a new variable U, and then U spits off the ones. Uh, thank you. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Oh, oh, uh, not U to one T. That should be one to one U. Yeah, it, there are smaller grammars for this, but it's just the thought process behind it that matters. Other questions? Who remembers De Morgan's laws? So what does De Morgan's laws tell us? Could I express intersection in terms of union and complement? Yeah. Oh, so if I have two sets, languages, whatever, if I want to express the intersection of them, how do I write that in terms of unions and complements? Yeah, so it's L1 complement, union, L2 complement, whole thing complement. What does this tell us? If CFLs were closing the complement, what can we say? They're closing an intersection. But are they closing the complement? No. So wait. What did we just show from this? They're not closing the intersection either. Man, this is depressing. CFL's not closed under intersection either. If you want a specific example, let's see if I remember it. Um, Check out these two languages. So 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 2 to the m, where n and m are at least 0. And L2 is similar, but it's 0 to the n, 1 to the m, 
to the m where same condition. So the first case I have uh, same number of zeros and ones followed by any number of twos. In the second case I have some any number of zeros followed by the same number of ones and twos. What's the intersection of these two? Well, they must have the same number of zeros and ones and the same number of ones and twos by definition of the two languages. So that means they have the same number of zeros, ones, and twos. Ah, so that must mean that uh, L1 intersect L2 is our favorite new language. So I'm just going to leave this as a Piazza thing. Uh, could you show that L1 and L2 are both context-free? If you can, then this will give us an example of, uh, of why they're not closed in the intersection. But De Morgan's laws tell us that there must be one. Cool. Any questions? Do you want to do another pumping lemma example? Sure. Okay. So let's do a rather famous one. So I call this one double. And what it is is it takes a language L and it's kind of like the palindromes where you have the second part reversed, but here we're going to not reverse the second one. So that means take any string in the language you want and then just make a copy of it with the original and put that in the language. So the palindromes one is you take a string out of the language, make a copy, but reverse the copy, stick them together, then uh, put it in. But here I'm not reversing it. I want to claim that this is not context-free in general. Note that this takes a language in and spits us out a language. What if I just put something like empty set as the language L? What's the resulting double of empty set? Is empty set. Is empty set context-free? Yeah, so you could come up with examples where it actually is context-free. But if I showed you one example where it's not context-free, would it show that it's not context-free in general? Yeah. So any choice of language you want to work with. So one of them that will work is sigma star. So take any string at all, double it, and put it in the language. And I want to show that double of sigma star is not context-free. So again, and, and for sake of argument, um, we're going to assume that it's that sigma is 0, 1. Because what if I said that sigma was just a single character, say 0? It was just all even length strings, and I can make a grammar for that. So I better assume that it has at least two characters, because uh, it won't work otherwise. OK, well, if I want to show that double of sigma star is not context-free for 0, 1, what should I do first? Uh, assume it is. So let's assume uh, double of sigma star is a CFL. Okay, well, it, it, we're going to show it's not, but what should we assume from that statement? The, well, well, there's a CFG, of course, for it, but for, in, in, for the purposes of the lambda, yeah, there's a pumping constant P for uh, L. So there exists a constant, just like before, P for L. So it's just, it starts out the same as before. Yeah, they got to pick a string with, again, I, I know I'm being consistent, but I swear people mess this up more than you think. What two properties of the string do we need? It's in the language and length at least p. So can you suggest me, a, so I'm going to suggest for you a bad string. So don't pick this string. So I'm going to pick 
uh, 0 to the p followed by 0 to the p. Why is this a bad string? So I'm actually going to say it's bad. Well, if v and y, whatever they are, contain an even number of characters, then no matter what I do, I'm still going to have an even number of characters at the end filled entirely with zeros. I'm never going to add a 1. So that means I'm always going to stay in this language. So I better not pick this one. Should I pick 1 to the p, 1 to the p? Mm. Better not pick that one either. What's a good choice? Oh, well, i got to have both characters in somehow. So uh, one that you can pick is uh, you can be safe and say 0 to the p, 1 to the p, 0 to the p, 1 to the p. So this one will actually work. There are smaller ones you can pick that will also work, but this is a perfectly good one because it's the same string twice, not reversed. Okay. So we got to look at one decomposition into five pieces or all of them? All of them. Well, what do they look like? Let's see. Well, could the v, x, y part, the thing we're interested in, could it be all in this first set of zeros? Yeah. Same thing for the ones, other zeros, other ones. Could it be uh, across one of the partitions, like from the first set of zeros to the first set of ones? Yeah, and then from ones to zeros, zeros and ones, of course. Could it cross uh, uh, two parts? No, because of the same argument from before because it must have at least p plus 2 characters. Well, let's see. Suppose that it actually is only in one of the partitions. So case 1. You, you could boil these down to one case, but let's just uh, keep it simple. Um, so case 1, v, x, y only in one partition. Actually, there's an easier argument than this. I just realized and it's much better. So divide the string up into, into uh, one half and the other half, like this, right? Suppose that VXY is entirely on the first half. So it's either in the first partition or the second one or mix or something like that. What could you do if you pump up? Well, if you add more characters on one side, what happened to the middle of the string? It moved. Well, that must have meant one, the last zero, uh, sorry, the last one on the first half must have crossed over on the second one because I put more characters on this side, right? So if I pump up, the one over on the left side must start on the right side now. So that means that the second piece, the second half, starts with a, with a one. But the first half starts with a zero. So could it be of the form W, W? Same string. No. So let's just uh, have the case be VXY only on first half. Then uh, I equals 2 has the resulting string have its second half start with a 1, but first half starts with 0. And so it therefore can't be of the form WW because they start differently. Okay, that's hopefully not too hard to see. What if VXY is only on the second half and, and we pumped up? I'm not sure what the argument is. You're right, but then, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. But the issue is that 
you're going to have a 0, 1, 0 over here, but you only have 0, 1 on the left side. Well, the, the reason we picked I equals 2 is we guarantee we can't pump up too far and push too much onto the right side. We can only push at most P characters onto the right side. And so, therefore, we can't put any zeros on the left side over onto the right side. Good question, though. Any other questions? Well, if it's entirely on the second half and we pumped up, that must mean that the zero on this on the right side must have moved over to the left side because we put more characters on the second half, right? So that must mean that the first half ends with a zero, but the second half ends with a one. So yeah, that's always true. So I'm not going to uh, write down every single thing, but it's very analogous to case one because it's almost the same argument uh, for when v, x, y only on second half. Did this did, did these two cases handle all possible decompositions, or are there some we have left? There's some left. Like, what would be a case of that? Right, the, the VXY part crosses the middle of the string. So, yeah, we need to worry about that case. So let's say that um, uh, VXY, so the way to write this is straddles the midpoint. It's very technical, by the way. Um, so let's see, what could we do here? Well, that by the fact that it straddles the midpoint, it contains some ones on the, on the first half and some zeros on the second half, right? Important question. If it's like this, do I ever touch the ones on the right side? Do I touch the zeros on the left side? What if we pumped up? That must mean that the number of zeros over here, oh, sorry, yeah, the number of zeros over here went up by some amount, and the number of ones over here went up by some amount. Did these two ever get touched? Oh, so could it be of the form WW? No, because if the number of ones over here is different than the number of ones over here, it can't be of the form WW. Couldn't one of those ends be touched? No, because if you look at the string, let's delete this line in the middle, then that must mean that we span right here. But since the length of VXY is at most P characters, I, I can't go too far. Other questions? Okay, so it straddles the midpoint, fine. So let's look at i equals 2. Then uh, first half uh, ends with more ones than the second half does. This is actually not entirely sufficient, but the only other possibility is that we push zeros onto the left half, but that's a structural problem like the first two cases already handle. So we're not really that worried about that. The key here is that um, uh, we're putting more characters into the middle two pieces, but not the outer two pieces. And so therefore, now we've handled every single case. It's either in the first half, in the second half, or it's right in the middle. So in the first two cases, we have a structural problem, like one half ends with some character that the other half doesn't. And the third case is to handle uh, the fact that we don't have the same number of a particular character on either side. So therefore, it can't be of the form WW. What can we conclude about the language now? So uh, yeah, double of, not CFL, sigma star is not a CFL. 
sadly. Okay? Any questions about that? Yeah? We're not really worried about that. We're more worried about um, the number of the string. If you just look at the string itself, we're not worried about each of the three pieces. We're just worried about whether where the entire string lives, the entire VXY part. So is it all on the first half, all on the second half, or somewhere in the middle? Uh, we're not worried about whether the X spans across the the, the middle or not, or whether the V crosses the middle or Y crosses the middle. Somewhere in the middle, they cross. The, the entire string crosses the middle somehow. And that's all we really care about, because then we can guarantee that one string ends with more characters than the other one does. Uh, uh, more of one character than the other one does. And so therefore, we're all set. Yeah, so it's, it's more, more high level, yeah. So at the very beginning, when we fix our W, Mm -hmm. Is there some technique that let us to pick that string? So, um, good question. You want an answer? <laughs> In fact, there's actually no te technique to like guarantee a string will be uh, workable. The key, key here that I'm trying to show you is that um, certain strings won't work, even if they're in the language and long enough, because of the fact that we can always pump that particular string because it's only of one character. Um, here, uh, the common technique is to um, have parts of the string be a certain length, at least P, for instance, and then just have repeated versions of that. Like here, I had WW, and I had 0 to the P, 1 to the P. Each part was P characters long. And then I just repeated that because I needed that to be in the language in the first place. <laughs> so the, the main point here is um, to get a string of length at least P first, then <coughs> modify it to get into the language. So here, note it's WW. So I picked a particular W right at the start, 0 to P, 1 to P, because the first case didn't work. And then I just duplicated it. But um, most of the time, like for the 0 to the n, 1 to the n, 2 to the n case, it's much easier to see what string to put there. Like for, if we wanted to show that perfect squares wasn't context-free, for example, then you would pick 0 to the p squared, because that's pretty much what the definition of the language is. A common technique is, uh, some people already here know, um, substitute the n in the language definition with p. And that usually works. But um, if we wanted something like, uh, so I think this is actually is context-free, but if we wanted to show it's not regular, for instance, then if we wanted like 0 to the n, 1 to the m, such that n is strictly larger than m, then what would a particular string here be? Zero, 1 to the? Uh, P minus one. minus one, yeah, yeah. So that so see how that works. Like you start out with a string of length P and then try to fit that with the language if you can. If instead we flip the script and said strictly less than M, then of course I would pick P plus one. But of course there are other strings you can pick. This, these are not the unique strings that always work. But it's just. The general strategy, yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try to make it obvious which string to pick, but I just want you to see the technique of trying to get a string in the language and long enough. That Those are the two main things. Other questions? All right, I'll see you on Wednesday.